All right, welcome back, and um, hopefully you're still awake. I, um, after eating and sitting down, it can sometimes you get a little tired, but I was blessed and encouraged. Thank you, Brother Gary, for sharing with us, and uh, I was deeply challenged in that last uh, talk that we had. Where does that extra money flow to? Where does it go? No matter if we're rich or if we're rather poor, what happens? And uh, yeah, I was so blessed. Um, before we start, I wanted to announce this, and I wish I would have done it here maybe before the youth left, but there is a number of books over there when you go right inside the door where you file through to get your food. Um, these books were sent over from America. It's um, from our business at home, and we're just gifting them to each of you. We are not taking them home. We want you to take these books home with you. Um, there's two different children's books. This is just one of them. So if you have children in the home, make sure you take, take one of those as long as they last. Uh, and there's a number of Gary's books. I didn't bring all of them, but I brought a number of them. Uh, there's one here on church matters. Of course, the book that he wrote on kingdom-focused finances. Uh, these books, I think there's enough, at least for the kingdom-focused finances for everyone. There's one here for the youth. It's for anybody. There's more than what the youth can take home, so take it with you. Tech Talk, as well as What Happened to Our Money, um, all very good books, and um, Gary has more, of course. So they're there to take uh, free of charge, so um, take them. And if there's any left um, by tomorrow afternoon, you see them there, and you know someone that would enjoy them, feel free to take it and hand it out. Just one, um, another little story that happened while we were here as a family. I think some of you have heard this, and, um, but there are some of you that haven't. And so I would like to just share. I, I enjoy coming to, to um, Ireland and just hearing the different uh, dialects. Uh, Ireland itself, you know, has many different dialects, different parts of the country. I love the, um, the English accent that I hear, and uh, British and all. It's just, um, it's good. I enjoy it. However, I don't always understand when they're speaking in that dialect. And so when I, when I came over, um, my, my children, especially the older ones, would kind of laugh at dad because, you know, I'm the leader, so I'm carrying on the conversation. But I didn't always understand what was being told to me, and I would respond in, you know, funny ways. Um, and one of them happened here locally. The, the church here, of course, does a family conference and the Bible camp. And so um, a local man that I got to know just right here in Dunmore East at the little Centra, his name is Billy, and uh, became good friends. And he would have extra things from the little Centra, like extra chips maybe that they had that couldn't sell or extra of something, and he, he knew the church would do different events, and he would say, you know, I have this, why don't you take it back with you? Um, and so that was good, and he was doing that even prior to me coming. And so I went in there one day, and he seen me up at the front of the store, and he came, and, and he said, um, before you leave, he said, I want to give you something. And I was like, yeah, that, in the inside, I was like, yeah, this is going to be good, I'm going to take something home. Uh, and then before he left, he said, are you a pastor man? And I said, yeah, I am. I'm a pastor. And uh, so I got my stuff and then went back to the store and he had this box of goods that he was going to give to me. And uh, I thanked him for it and opened the box up and here it's full of pasta. <laughs> and so he asked me, are you a pasta man? Like, do I like pasta? And I thought, he said, am I a pastor, man? And uh, so I received pasta that day, and uh, it was good. So I um, may, may not quite understand sometimes what you say. And if I don't, you correct me. I'll uh, hopefully get it. The mother's role in the home. Let's um, move into that. You can maybe turn those lights off. 
Hopefully you can read. I know my background is a bit harder to read, but hopefully you can read that. We are going to, we're going to start uh, reading um, in Genesis. Let's, let's turn to Genesis. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn to Genesis chapter 2. I'm just going to read a number of verses there before we get started. Genesis chapter 2. And it's just the, the creation of, of woman and the beauty of that and God's design. Genesis 2, and we will start reading in, uh, let's start reading in verse 15. Genesis 2, verse 15. And the Lord God took man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found an helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I'm going to read the first verse in chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And then it goes on, of course, in what took place. And we will maybe reflect on that verse. That's all we will read there in the, um, the beginning. But I just wanted to kind of set the stage there of the creation of woman. Of course, we all, we all know that. We've read it many times. But I think it's just good to, to look at that again. I don't normally use PowerPoint, and so that's why I'm not as um, put together here with it, and I tend to look back here and make sure everything's going right. So we just read that. Um, very important that we understand that woman was created by God. The account in the, in the scripture like we just read is very important that we understand that woman was created before the fall. We understand that as well. And some of what I share here today will be a bit of a repetition of what I shared um, earlier this morning, but I think that's just fine. Her order in creation after man to be his helpmeet is very important to understand that this was God's design and placement for woman, and it did not happen or did not come about because of the fall, because of the, the wrong choice that Eve made. Woman's placement and role was not because of her sin. Okay, so we just want to make sure that we understand that she did not become a lesser person because of the choice that she made there in the garden. And if you notice that the, the last verse we read there in chapter 3, how the serpent went went right around the whole headship order. He went to the woman first, went around the man, went to the woman, and did the tempting, and of course, she yielded. He knew the importance of structure, and so he went around it, and, and it worked. There are two words here that I feel we want to get straight and understood um, and those words are this, help meet 
and submission. Two words that I want to just look at here briefly and what they mean. I think I had mentioned that earlier. Um, help me would, would mean an assistant or an aide. It's nothing to look down on, but it's a blessing to be that assistant or aide. How does this verse sound um, that I'm going to read here next? Just think about, let me read the verse and the word help, not help me, but the word help is in there. But listen to the beauty of it. Psalms 22, 19 says, But be thou not far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. And that same Greek, that same Hebrew word is the same as the help me here as it relates to the woman. So here it's a beautiful picture of the Lord being that strength, being that help for me. The same Hebrew word. So it's nothing to look down on, but something rather to be excited about and to be inspired to be that help me for you as godly mothers and women to be that help me and that support to the man who can not do without. Think about it in that way. This help me complements the man and makes him complete. It complements the man and makes him complete. Just for just a bit of an illustration Think about, um, think about this. Okay, so what is, what, what is this? Jimmy, you have any idea what this is? Uh, it's a chocolate cake, right? Um, anything wrong with it? I mean, it's, it's, it's a cake, right? Not finished. Not finished? What's it missing? Cream and icing. Cream and icing. So that's a cake, and it's just kind of all by itself. Um, it is. It's missing the icing, right? And so as I, think of, as I think of God looking at man, creating man, and then, you know, he says something's not complete. Something's not quite complete yet, and he needed to bring an aid in there and help me, someone that would help. And so I see the beauty of the woman, and let's just say that she is the icing on the cake, if you want to call it like that, okay? The icing on the cake. And so maybe some of you that are here are not married, and that's just fine. You are blessed by, all of us had a mother, and so you are blessed by a woman in your life in some way or another. Those of us who are married are blessed by a woman. And so there you have two pieces of cake that come together. There's icing in there. That cake becomes a total different cake than what we had before. The other evening they had um, some cake here, and they had just like blocks of cake. And that would have not been as appealing, but right beside that they had, you know, nice cream that you could put on top. And so just a beautiful picture of this help me, this woman that God created to come alongside man, to just kind of finish it off, to bring that beauty, to bring that sweetness. Um, it's beautiful. Another word that maybe you could go along with this help meet, and, and I know, you know, that's, I think for some people they get maybe hung up on that and don't see the importance of it, but think of a life jacket if you know what I'm talking about, a life jacket, if you go swimming or something like that, or if you're you know, out on the water on a boat and it's, you don't know how to swim, you put a life jacket across of you so that if you fall out, you're, you know, you're safe. That is there to give you that aid from going under. And so I see the wife being created if kind of in that purpose as well. She's that life jacket, that support that we need to carry us through. We all know the importance of what a helper does. We need helpers in the work that we do, um, in the home, wherever we're at. We can't do the work by ourselves. And then that willing helper, that, that helper that comes along that's willing and is happy to help. And we'll, we will talk about um, wives and mothers in the home coming alongside and being that blessing. The other word that describes a woman's role in the home is the one submit. And that to society is a word um, they struggle with. They don't like it. 
And we don't even personally sometimes like that either. That whole thought of submitting is not a, is not a natural for us. It's something that we have to work at. But submitting is very important for a godly mother. Ephesians 5, 22. Let me advance these slides here. Yeah, so now we're on track. Submit. Ephesians 5, 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. There's no question what that means, right? Submitting yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Here again, it's the call for the woman to humbly respect and obey the leader that God has put into her life. It's not the thing of that she has to come under, but she wants to. She feels that, and she sees the importance of that. Another really good example, if you're, if you're still um, struggling with that word submitting, and that is of when Jesus was willing to submit to the Father and to come. Did that make Jesus a lesser person when he submitted to the will of the Father? No, absolutely not. We understand that. We see the Trinity. We see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and we see that those respective roles. Are they any lesser value, one or the other? No, no, they're all one. Jesus was willing to submit to the will of the Father, and this made it possible for him to come here and for us to experience that freedom and experience eternal life. And so, if you take that now and turn that picture around, the husband needs to submit to God as his leader, as his authority. The wife now is called to submit to her head, which is her husband, and the husband and wife now are one flesh. They come together and they are now to submit to God because they come together and the wife in that whole picture is of no lesser value because they are one. No lesser value. Let's make sure we understand that, that we are not talking about one being better than another. I had shared, I think, just this morning, just a bit about that, but, but a couple of, well, it's been back some time ago, I was at our school, and I asked our children there in the school, what are some things they appreciate about, appreciate about their mother? And they said things about, you know, mom that they would have never said about dad. And I think that's just across the board for a godly mother. Our godly mothers, they said, loves them. Godly mothers, they said, would read to them. And I think us fathers do that some too. But I think the mother does so much more of that. The godly mother is in the home. She cooks. She cares for those that are sick. That's where the children run when they're hurt, when they're in trouble. They go to mom, most generally. Let's look at the, some, of the, some of the ways here that mothers in the home um, can, can bless and encourage families, children, and, of course, husbands, and beyond that, even beyond that, into the, uh, the community there. So when we look at this, we are going to look at, we're going to look at ways that the mother can be a help meet, that, that aid to the man, that assistant, and we're going to look at, in order to find those, we're going to look at the needs that us as men have, because that's what they're there for. They're there to help us, and so we have needs, and so let's find out what the needs are for us as men. You know, we are pretty needy creatures, and so we need that help. The first one that I have here, and we're going to try to be fairly practical with these, um, the first one I have is a husband needs someone to depend on him. Why do I say that? Man is to lead the home, but there's something about dependence that the wife, when she depends on him, kind of calls to our manliness. It's just kind of in us. We want to be able to um, have someone to depend on us, to, to understand that they, they're relying on us. Our makeup as men wants to provide and to nurture and even to protect our family and our wives. That's just kind of built into us. To bring you know, the paycheck home and say, you know, here, this is what I've worked hard for. 
I'm providing for the home. That feels good to us as men. If, we, if, if that's not needed, uh, then we, we feel somewhat you know, lost. Um, I always enjoy going out, so I, I told you that I enjoy hunting. I don't do near as much of it, but I enjoy just even going out and to be able to come back and to um, let my wife see that I was successful. We find fulfillment and satisfaction in meeting the needs of the home our children, and our wives. A godly wife will allow her husband to be that provider, to be her provider, and will not control how he provides. He will, she will let him provide as he can. Not that they can't work together, talk together about things, but um, she will accept that as her husband being that provider. Another need that a man has is that a husband needs someone who accepts him as he is. This doesn't mean that the husband has no place to grow and you say, well, it's just who I am. Um, no, not, not that at all. But this means that all men are not the same. I am much different than, you know, the rest of you. And to accept that, to know that my wife accepts me as I am is a beautiful, beautiful experience. To have, we have different personalities, we have different giftings, we have different, uh, some of us maybe own a business, some of us work for someone else. Um, and to not, you know, not to make those judgment calls, but to accept your husband in the place that God has gifted him in. A marriage, a marriage, uh, let's see here. I may not, I may have, yeah, I just, just missed one there. A marriage should be the place where you develop the deepest level of human friendship and relationship. It's where you develop the deepest level of human friendship and relationship. The marriage can also be the potential of doing just the opposite of that. And we all know that that can happen. Um, and it's sad when we see that happen. Does your husband know that he is the best? Do you tell him that? A husband needs that assurance. He needs that understanding that in spite of his weaknesses, you do appreciate him, his faults. Whatever it is, you are willing to work with him on that. We as husbands all know we are to lead, but if we sense we are not accepted, then, then we tend to shy away from leading because we're, we're worried what, you know, what's, what's the wife going to say and what's, what's going to happen, and that then brings about huge, huge problems. A husband needs someone who encourages and supports him. Some of these kind of go right along the same line as the other one, but... Um, Encouraging and supporting him. We all understand that this comes much easier when the husband is relating and communicating well in the home. When the husband is doing his, his godly role, of course that will come much, much easier. But he needs to feel that support. On the flip side, the godly wife will recognize when things maybe are not going so well, for whatever reason, and that happens. We, we have times when things are a bit in a upheaval and we're struggling through whatever it is. But to still have that word of encouragement um, is very, very powerful. Just, um, just a couple, I'd say a month or two ago, my, my uncle um, passed away. He was quite old. His wife is still living. And he was a man... Um, he was a man that struggled through life, through their marriage. They, they stayed together the whole time, had a number of children. Um, there had been some issues and struggles within yeah, the home there. But he lived a bit of a hypocritical life. And through all of that, his dear wife, I don't know, I don't know that she hardly ever said you know, anything bad about him at all. She was there for him. She's the sweetest person, um, one of the sweetest ones that I, I ever 
came across. She, she's, just, she's just amazing what she did with the situation that she found herself in. I think that is probably one reason they stayed together the way they did, and she's been a huge blessing. Husbands and wives do not agree all the time on everything, but in the end, to feel that support in spite of that difference is what we need. And I think that's what my uncle experienced. He, he felt that support from his wife, not, not in the wrong that he had, but she continued to encourage him and to be there along him as he struggled. Ways that you can encourage and support your husband is by your gratitude, your thankful heart in what you have and what you, maybe you don't have, by your smile. Uh, let's see here. Yes, by your smile. It's good to see you. Coming home from work, um, to experience that, to have a, a wife that's there, has a smile on her face, that's not always going to happen because they have struggles. But it's, a, it's sure the blessing when you can experience that. The, to find that they are happy. Um, it's interesting, Josiah, what you just shared because that's uh, a point here. When mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Um, that's kind of the idea of what's said in America anyway. And so we want, we want mom to be happy. And, and that, when, that's, when that happiness is there, it just, it just does something for, for the husband and for the entire family as well. A husband needs his wife's touch in the home, in the home atmosphere. Um, Proverbs 14.1. Let me just read that. It says, Every wise woman, I have that here, Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. Titus 2. I'm going to read uh, three verses. And just listen in. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, holy women, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Keepers at home, that's where I'm going with this. The woman is to have, the mother is to have that, that touch in the home. And that can only happen if she is a keeper at the home and is there to, to bless the home in that way. We as husbands are inadequate to, to um, you know, say, decorate the home or to put that atmosphere in there. Yeah, we're a part of that. But it seemed like for the mother to do that, it just is her role and it's a beautiful, beautiful way. A wife and a mother in the home is the one who sets that atmosphere. She does far better than what we can ever do as men. Meal times around the table, um, the food that is prepared, um, it's, it's just it's a beautiful experience. The atmosphere of the home is huge. Notice that I said atmosphere, not the expensive decorations. It's not you can fill your house with all the nice decorations, but it's the atmosphere. Um, that pleasant atmosphere that we experience. Contrary to modern thought, homemaking is not a second-rate job whatsoever. It actually takes more skill than some high-class woman in society working for the richest business. It takes more skill to be at home doing what God has called you to. A wife, a mother, needs to be a stay-at-home mom that was just mentioned here. Um, not out providing financial needs for the family. I'm not saying there's never a time when something like that can, needs, can happen, maybe for a short period or something. I, I, but, but for the most part, if there's children in the home, that's where a mom needs to be. She needs to be there to take care of the children, the needs of the home. It doesn't make sense for the mother to be out making money Children somewhere in a daycare center, um, it is not the way God designed it or planned it. You are called to provide that atmosphere and to bring that atmosphere in the home of order, beauty, cleanliness, and warmth. Um, it's great. You are the heart of the home's atmosphere. You're that heartbeat in your home. 
You know, businesses have high-ranking positions, and they call them um, CEO and CFO, and those are all terms we understand, you know, chief financial um, officer and, and all of that. And so I think the wife plays that very high role in the home. We can call her the, call her the CHO, chief home officer, or uh, maybe the, the CCO, the chief cook officer. Um, it's, just, it's just what works best, and it's best we, we let them be the chief in that, in that area, and um, they, will, they, will do very, they do very well. You are called to provide in this way for the family. I, I have down here food being a big part of a, of a woman's role in the home. I know some of you enjoy cooking more than others. Some, for some of you, it's maybe a, something you really enjoy. Others, it's more of a, more of a challenge. But, but food is, is huge. To sit around the table as a family and to, and to have food that you have prepared as a mother, um, it's... It's beautiful. For me, and you ask anybody in my family, it's one of the favorite, it is probably the favorite time of my day when, when, we, when I can come home um, and we can sit around the table as a family and enjoy a very good meal. Um, I can work all day at the place of business that I work at and we do metal fab work and so I can, I can produce you know, something really nice but I'm not able to bring that home with me and put it in the living room or set it on the table and, and we all enjoy it. I mean, they, they would care less, really, of what took place. But your wife can make that meal and you can sit around it and you can enjoy it um, and it's, have a great conversation, a beautiful, beautiful um, experience. I have been blessed over and over again talking about the, the, the heartbeat of the home and the woman's role in that I have done, not a lot, but I have done, gone out some in sharing in churches and then being invited into people's homes, um, you know, for an evening dinner or for a lunch or something like that. And I, I always enjoy going into the homes just to experience that atmosphere and to, to see that bit of culture. E each family kind of has their own little culture that, that comes about because of a husband and wife. But I've, I've been so challenged in going to different people's homes. Back some time ago, we were at a, um, at a church, and we were there for about a week, and we were into different of the homes, and one of the homes that we went into was an elderly couple um, named uh, David and Marie, David and Marie um, Yoder. Barbara, you would know them. And uh, they were there in Virginia where we were at, and we went to their home, an older couple, he has since passed, and I, I was, I'll never forget that experience. Um, an older couple had us into their home, sat around their table, um, and, and just the atmosphere in that home, it was an older home, it was, just, it was just really, really a blessing to me. And the conversation that we had was great. Later that same week, we went into another home, and this was a young married couple. And we sat around their home, and it was just fairly you know, newly furnished. They, they were just beginning life together, and we sat around that table with them. A complete different feel, but yet a very beautiful time. And that all happened around the table, around the meal that that mother and wife prepared. Um, it, it was very, very good um, times. I've been in homes of single ladies, ladies that have never been married. We, we have a, a number of them in our church and back probably, well, not that long ago, we were invited to one of their, one, one of, uh, their homes, and she provided a beautiful experience, and she had multiple people there. I was just so blessed um, by her hospitality and the way she, she blessed us in that way. So the role you play as godly, Women, wherever God has placed you, singlehood, mothers, or wherever, is huge, and you can bless so many people as you use that, that role. I've said this a number of times, and I'll say it again, but that the, the meal that my wife prepares on a Sunday 
afternoon and we have company over after church or even if it's just for us. The meal that she prepares on a Sunday is just as important as the message that I prepare and share that Sunday. And maybe you say, oh, that's a little bit strange to think that way. But I, I think you understand what I'm saying. The meals that the cooks are preparing, are they lesser of an importance than me up here sharing or Gary? Um, it's very important. You look at what happens over there, and we fellowship around those tables. We enjoy that food. Um, there's no lesser place in it, the way I look at it. It touches lives in different ways, but all very, very important ways. A husband needs someone who can be trusted and is faithful. Proverbs 31.10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband thus safely trusts in her. That is Proverbs 31, 10 and 11. That thought of the heart of the husband being completely entrusted to her, knowing that he doesn't have anything to worry about. Fidelity in marriage is a must. Anything outside of this causes major, major consequences. We know that. We've seen that happen where, where this has been broken and, and, and there's, yeah, there's just huge consequences in that. Scars that are there for life. Sure, things can be forgiven, but there is, there is um, there's deep pain and hurt in it. A godly wife will guard her manners, her speech, and her appearance, reserving her charm and beauty for her husband and her husband alone. There's no need to attract anyone else than your husband. So keep this in mind as wives in the home. Why try to attract attention outside of that relationship? Keep your motives pure and godly. Um, here's a number of verses in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 4, it says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wise, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair and wearing of gold or a putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So do we understand what that verse is calling you as mothers and wives women to be. It's clear. I believe it's very clear. But society totally ignores that. I, I go back to some of Gary's slides, you know, where, you know, that should put a stop to it, but, but we can go around it. Right along with that same thought, I would strongly encourage that the books, I don't know if you as women read but the books that you read, I think, are very important as well. There's a lot of um, fictitious books out there and, you know, love stories and things like that. And I think those have taken uh, women down um, a, a wrong road. And I think women are drawn to those more than men because of their, their, um, their emotional, the way they're made up and their relational type um, demeanor, they, they're wanting that, and if they don't feel that in the home, then maybe they want to read about it. So I caution you to be very careful in those types of books that you read. A novel is just that. It's not, it's not true, necessarily. And so, so be, be aware of that. These books only set you up for disappointment because real life is much more than a love novel. Um, the greatest book, of course, to read is God's Word. And I think the call for you as mothers is to find yourself in God's Word and then to write your own book as it relates to relating to your family and to your husband in a godly way. The husband needs to feel 
your love and respect. He needs to feel that. Ephesians 5.33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. That, that love and respect and that feel that comes from that, we as husbands need it. For a husband to feel that love and respect means the world. It really does. I, I appreciate so much when my wife comes to me and she says, I respect you for what you have chosen to do or the direction that we have chosen to take she respects and that it feels good it feels it, it just gives me that boost in knowing that we are together in that the opposite of that is disrespect and of course we know that that's a direction we don't want to go it's the thought of you know it's, it's going to be my way or no way and that that in a relationship husband and wife relationship is, is very difficult We as husbands and wives can have our differences, but we have to be willing to respect each other in those differences. I, I think of a of a situation that came up in our marriage way, way early. I don't even think I ever told this to my wife, so she'll hear it for the first time. Um, talking about respecting each other in, in differences. So... I would go out and mow the yard on a, on a riding, we had like a riding mower. And we had some, you know, our young ch children coming up. And I thought that it'd be neat to have, you know, our, my little boy sitting on the mower with me and I'm, I'm going to mow the yard because I'm teaching him how to mow. And it's just neat. Dad's mowing, you know, and the little boy can ride along. And, but, but mom felt like that's not safe because... The mower is very dangerous, and it is. It's very dangerous. And if the child falls off, what happens? Uh, we actually had an accident in our, in our church years ago where that took place. Well, it wasn't quite like that, but it was a mower accident, and the child's foot was badly, badly cut and cut off um, parts of it. And so for me to respect that, I, didn't, I, never, I never came back to you and said, that's ridiculous. No, I, I respected that. And for the most part, unless she wasn't looking, um, <laughs> no, we, we, I, I kept the, the children off the mower. Um, not saying that it never happened, but it's, that is, and that's what I'm talking about. Those things, we respect each other and we understand there's a reason for it. My wife packs, you know, three days, four days before we go, I pack couple hours before we go and everything's fine. She wants to know when we're going to go to the airport, you know, three days before we go. And we're like, that's too early to decide. We don't, we'll get to the airport. But I need to work with her on that. And if she wants to know three days ahead of time what time we're going to leave to go to the airport, I don't need to say that's ridiculous and just, you know, just we, we respect each other and work together in that. Husbands need to spend time each day. Your husband needs to spend time each day having you pray for him. Pray that God would lead him and that he would follow his leader. Pray that God would give wisdom in decisions that are to be made. Pray that God will guard and protect your husband's thoughts and his, his mind as he is out in society working and the enemy wants to, to get a hold of your husband and to destroy him in any way that he can. But pray that God would protect him and that he would be able to live in victory. Pray that God will give you strength as a helper to be that aid, that assistant to your husband. The enemy wants to take the leader of the home out. That's his goal, is to take the leader of the home out. And so pray to that end. Pray that God would protect the leader of your home. The godly woman and her standards of living are like, they're vastly, vastly different than what society and the world demands of a woman. They stand, they stand in literally complete contrast to each other. 
The world, here is what the world demands um, to be an ideal woman. They would demand materialism, a career, social acceptance, attractiveness, style, fashion, leisure, and the part of life, and more. But those are just some of the things that society looks at a woman and says, this is what you need to be in order to be a woman. The godly woman is to live a meek and a quiet life, completely, completely opposite of what the world demands. Supporting her husband, guiding her home, this in the sight of God and of her husband is, is a great price. May God bless each of you as women in the home, whether you're married, single, you can reach, you can touch people's lives in a huge way. Truly, truly you are the icing on the cake. You, you make, you, you're kind of that finishing touch and you bless many, many people as you follow God's plan for your life.